James is writing to Christians who are scattered abroad because of their faith. And, um, and he tells them, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the trials, you need to hold on to your most holy faith. You need to hold on to Jesus. So remember, chapter one, in the midst of trials, hang on to Jesus, keep walking with the Lord, don't slide back. Now, if you remember, as we went through chapter two and three, he talks about faith without works. Faith without works in the sense that, you know, as you're going through the difficulties, as you're going through the trials of your faith, you know what? God's working something out. So we believe that faith works. We don't believe you're saved by works. You, we believe you're saved by grace, but we believe if you're really saved, it's going to show forth works in your life. You're going to want to do things for Jesus. And the context is even in the midst of painful, difficulty, difficult times, you're still wanna, gonna wanna try to do things for Jesus. Yes, you're gonna slide back sometimes. Yes, you're gonna stumble. You're gonna go through some things. But if you really love Jesus, you're gonna get up because faith without works is dead, the scriptures say. Chapter three, true faith, remember, true faith should be a loving faith. If you have brothers and sisters in Christ that have needs, you know what? You, you shouldn't be, just be a Christian that says, hey, be warmed and filled. Be warmed. I'll pray for you. No, Christians are involved in feeding the poor, helping the homeless, helping the downtrodden, picking them up. We should have a loving faith if it's real faith. And then we should have a living faith, a living faith that we're, 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 as we're tested, as we're tried, we're going to lean on the word of God. Again, not looking for perfection, but we're looking for growth. You're going to keep going for Jesus, a living faith, a loving faith, a faith that perseveres in trials. And then remember, at the end of chapter 3, he gives an exhortation to those who are just, can be talk, who are just talkers. Talking the talk, talking the talk, talking the talk. He goes, well, walk the walk. Walk the walk. He says, you know, if you think you're wise... You think you got it together, show out of your lifestyle a, a holy life with a sacrificial heart that wants to help others. And he talks about wisdom from below, wisdom from the world is sensual, it's devilish, it's selfish, it has its ends. That's all it cares about. That's the world's wisdom. My way, my way, how am I going to get my way? How are things going to get done for me? Uh, this is what I think is right. It should be the way I want it to be. He says that's wisdom from below. He says wisdom from above, it's pure. It's peaceable. It's easy to be entreated, full of mercy, without partiality. That's wisdom from above. He goes, so if you're really walking with Jesus, you're going to be using wisdom from above, not wisdom from below. So what was happening to some of these Christians in some of these churches was this. They were what? They were going through it. They were battling. And as they were struggling, they were letting their fleshly natures come out. And it was causing pain. It was causing division. It was causing difficulties. And they were justifying it. They were justifying their behavior. Well, they're wrong. They shouldn't treat me this way. This isn't right. And James is like, he's a preacher here. He's really preaching. And he puts it right on him. He says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? That war in your members. He goes, the problems that you're having with one another and in the churches... They're coming from your own nature, from yourself, from inside of you, because you're not using the wisdom from above. What is it that when, when people get saved, right, they think they get saved, and then they, you know, they, they, they come to a church, and they, they love things for a while, and this and that, and then they think they got it all together, so it's their job to tell everybody what to do. Really? Tell everybody what to do. Well, God spoke to me, and God told me this, and God told me that. And they think it's amazing. It's amazing. And the Christian church, is, it's the only people that think that, well, I hear from God. I hear from God. I don't have to listen to any pastor. I don't have to listen to any preacher. I don't have to listen to any spiritual authority. I don't have to listen to the head of the ministry. I don't have to listen to this one. I hear from God. I hear from God. I hear from God. And what I tell people like that is, you know, you should have your own church then. 
And watch how far you get with that kind of attitude. Hear from God, hear from God, hear from God. And, and then sometimes I have to have simple conversations with people. And I have, to, I have to tell them, do you really think you're hearing from God with this kind of attitude? It sounds like James 4 to me. It sounds like there's things going on in your heart. And I ask them, when you go to work, what happens when you tell the boss, no, 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 I don't agree. No, 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 we need to do it this way. No, 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 I, I, I can do it better. I, I got it figured out. I can do it. Even if you've been doing it longer than them. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. You've been a boss of your own company for five years. I can do it this way. You know what's going to happen to you? Eventually, bye-bye. But what happens, with, what is it, with, how, how's that creep into the church, though? How's that creep into the church? How's that happen? Well, I'm free in Jesus, so I don't have to listen to anybody anymore. That's exactly what they were doing in the Corinthian church. Remember, remember they, they were, some of them were getting saved, and they had a yoke of slavery upon them that they owed to pay back a debt to some of the rich landowners. They, they, they sold themselves into slavery. They owed a debt. You know what Paul told them? Just because Jesus saved you and he freed you from eternal hell doesn't mean you don't have to stay under that slavery and pay back your debt. He says if you were, sla if you were saved a free man, you're a free man. But if you were saved a slave, go back and pay off your debt and be a slave. What? That's what it says. See, because people gravitate to these things. They gravitate to the fleshly nature. I heard from God. I heard from God. I don't have to fall under any church authority, any authority anywhere. I hear from God. I hear from God. I, listen, I tell this story sometimes. I, I, I was a manager at um, Lowe's for a long time. And at the end of the day, we used to pass out these department closing checklists. All right? So it was my job to give out the checklist like at the beginning of their shift and at the end of their shift, it was my job to go collect the closing checklist, which had to do with you know, cleaning out the aisles, front face on the shelves, making sure everything is clean, prices are on the beams, all that stuff, right? So it was my job to go and check these things, okay? And there was this one kid every night, every night. Well, I couldn't get it done. I couldn't get it done. Too many customers. Too many. That's always the excuse. Too many customers. Too many customers. Too many. You ever been to these places? When you come in, they go like this. Yeah, over there. They go, go find it. You can find your product down there over there. No one's helping nobody. We used to call it an apple orchard. When all the red vests were together, you know, at, at Lowe's. You guys are having an apple orchard. When I was a manager at Home Depot, it was a pumpkin patch. You guys are having a pumpkin patch over here. Don't. So, but then you see, because sometimes it could be legit, it could be legit that there were a lot of customers, and customers first, you know, you can't fix the shelves, do all that stuff, but then, you know, we're not stupid, right? So you check the sales, check the sales. Well, your department was supposed to do this, you know, here was your goal for the day, and you only did this much, and it looks like you had three customers. So what are you doing? Nobody told me? Nobody told me, finally. I kept calling him out. He goes, aren't you a pastor? Aren't you supposed to treat people nice? I'm a Christian. I'm actually going to seminary. You shouldn't treat me this way. I said, you're an idiot. I said, let me, let me explain something to you. I said, let me explain something to you. I said, you should be the one that I have to check on the least. You should be the one that's going over and above. You should be the one serving. Well, this isn't what, this isn't what God wants me to do. I said, what are you, stupid? I said, you're here. You're here. You're getting paid. You have a wage. Do your job and do it right or else go. Amen. Amen. He didn't like that. But what is this stuff? I'm saved. I don't have to listen. I don't have to get along with others. I hear from Jesus. Well, you're not hearing from him clearly. That's what was going on with some of these early Christians. Dividing, fighting with one another. And then they're praying and asking God for his will. They're praying and asking the Lord for help in their lives. And they're not getting any answers. And James is going to tell you why. He says this, verse 2, You lust, you have not, you kill, you desire to have, and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not, because you Ask not. And when you ask, 
you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. So you know what that kid must have been praying for? God, keep this manager away from me. <laughs> keep him away from me. He's not a good Christian, God. He's supposed to be, the way he talks to me is not right. So God answered his prayer by sending me over there every night. <laughs> every night. Every night. They were asking for the wrong things. They were praying for the wrong things. They were not being thankful for what they already had and what God was doing. Lord, I need this, and if you just give me that job, if you just give me that boyfriend, I'll be happy. If you just give me that girlfriend, I'll be happy. Lord, if you just give me this, if you just give me that Mercedes, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> right? And then it's not fair, God, because uh, sister so-and-so has this, and they have that, and I should be able to have that too, and then they're judging. Then they're judging one another. Well, they must be doing something wrong. They must be doing something wrong. That's why they have it. Then they're judging. All that's going on and all the backbiting's going on. And, and, and they're wondering why they're not being blessed of God. They're asking amiss. They don't have thankful hearts. Listen, because sometimes all we focus on is what we don't have. Sometimes all we focus on is, you know, Lord, when, it, when am I going to get this? When's my ship going to come in? Everyone else's is coming in, in my ministry, in my life, with my finances, when, when, when? Instead of being thankful, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Lord always, because his mercy endures forever. Give thanks. He's my refuge, my strong tower, my rock, and him will I trust, right? Give thanks to the Lord. Be thankful. Lord, I have air to breathe. I have food to eat. In abundance, God, thank you. How about being thankful for what we have? We're always so focused on what we don't have. And listen, you can't help but when you start to think about others and pray for others that don't have, you know what I mean? You start to think about yourself a little bit less. So when you're starting to feel selfish, when you're starting to feel like it's not fair and God's not answering your prayers, you know what? Start to focus on others that have a lot less than you. Start to pray for them. James says you have all these battles and all these wars and all these divisions. He says it's coming from your own lust. Because everybody's sitting there saying, my will be done. My will be done. My way. Listen, fights don't happen in the church and amongst Christians because Christians are sitting there saying, hey, I want to serve. I want to serve. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if anybody even knows my name. I want to serve. Fights don't happen because people are lining up to serve and lining up to be humble and lining up to say, I don't care if anybody knows my name. Fights happen because of this. Well, I've been coming here for so long and how come this doesn't have to, you know, how come I don't get this and I don't think they're, they're qualified enough and I think I'm more qualified. That, that's why fights happen. And the leadership's overlooking me, and they don't care about me, and I think this, and I think they're trying to hold me back and hold me down, and that's, that's why fights happen. It's from our nature. It's in us. And then when we, we start blaming others, blaming others, it goes all the way back to the garden. It's Satan's fault. It's the woman's fault. It's everyone's fault. Ultimately, God, you made everything, so it's your fault. Those of you who are in the trades know what I'm talking about. The plumber blames the electrician. The electrician blames the sheetrocker. This one blames the contractor. Everybody's blaming everybody. We're always pointing the finger at out. We got enough to deal with in our own hearts. We got enough for the Lord to clean up in our, in, in our own lives, in our own hearts. How can we be so worried about when everybody else is doing and not doing and, and, and then how do we have time to compare what we have to others? You don't, you don't have that kind of time. Spend time. Spend that time. If you have time to compare what this one has and this one's gifts and this one's finances, if you have that much time, you know what you could be doing? Using that time to better yourself in your life with Jesus. Amen. Now listen, this, this guy's a preacher, all right? He's going to come off real strong, real strong here. 
because he puts them right in their place. He comes, you know, he doesn't water it down. He says this, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship of the world is enmity or it's against God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. He's saying this to Christians. He say, don't sit there and say that you love God. Don't sit there and call yourself a Christian. Don't sit there and say you love God if all you think about is doing things the world's way and, and the world's ways and judging one another the way the world judges one another and uses one another to, to, to get one up on somebody else. He goes, you're adulterers and adulteresses. You're acting like the world and you're a friend of the world. Don't you know that's against God? It's rhetorical. They know. But they're not living out their most holy faith. They know. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, and the world passes away in the lusts thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Now listen, when I preach verses like this, you know what people do? This is what they do. As you people hear it, hear it for yourselves. And then instantly, there's something in our nature that lust, that's lusting against the Spirit. He's going to say it in the next verse. There's something in our nature that says, well, Pastor Matt, that's easy for you to say because you have this and sister so-and-so has that. How come you can have these things in the world, but how come I can't? How come you can have these gifts and how come I can't? How come this one can live here and in this place and how come I can't have that? How come these people can have these things in the world and enjoy them, but how come I can't? It's natural. That's naturally what comes to us right away. Right away. And listen, it's been the downfall of many people. You're always chasing what somebody else has, worrying about what somebody else does. You'll be doing that forever. The scriptures say to run your own race with Jesus. That's what they say. And you know what? When you start to think that everybody else is getting more than you and has more than you and is blessed more than you and all the, when you start to think that way, you know what you're doing? You're minimizing what the Lord has already done in your life and you're angry at God because you don't think it's fair. Not fair. Not fair. You know, big corporations, I'll give Lowe's illustrations again, right? Big corporations, they have HR departments, human resources departments. You know what the human resource department is set up for? Exactly that. To make sure that everybody's being treated the same. Everything is lining up. Because what do they hear complaints with all day? Well, this one gets this and this one did that. And I was told to clean two aisles. But the manager only told that guy to clean one aisle. And this one said this and this one that. Well, the, and then what the HR does, they have to stand on the policies. Well, the policy says this and the policy says that. The policy says this and the policy says that. They have all those departments, the, 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 the HR department, so they don't get sued. You know where the HR department is here? Me and the pastors, right? Human resource. That's all we do is deal with humans. Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? There's something in us. There's something in us that always lusts to envy. There's something in us that always wants to compare. There's something in us that always wants to judge. There's something in us. It's the Adam nature. It's our fallen nature. It's us, but it ain't Jesus. It's not Jesus. You want to see some prayers get answered? You want to see some prayers get answered? Their prayers weren't getting answers because it was, Lord, I want this. Lord, I want that. Lord, it's not fair that they get that. Lord, I want you to judge them. I don't think it's right. Lord, that, he said, you guys are praying that way? You're asking amiss. You're not going to get nothing from God. You, wanna, you want your prayers answered? Lord, 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 I want to see things the way you see things. Lord, I want my heart to ache more for the people that are hurting. Lord, I want my heart to ache more for broken marriages. Lord, I want my heart to ache more for, 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 
for, for all the singles that are out there that, that feel lonely, Lord. Lord, I want my heart to break for these things. Lord, Lord, you know what? I, give me opportunities to give away more of my substance, give away more of my stuff. You know, start to pray that way. You want to see some prayers get answered? Get answered real fast. Real fast. Now he's going to give a remedy here. And he's going to make it real simple. He's going to make it real simple. Now listen, some of us, we go through these things, right? Because we fall into this all the time. We get angry. We get judgmental. We get upset. We, get, we, we hurt one another sometimes. Sometimes we have envy in our hearts. The spirit lusts after envy. You know what the scriptures say? Look at this next verse. But he gives more grace. But he gives more grace. He gives more grace. See, so if you had an envious spirit this week, you just ask Jesus for forgiveness and he gives you more grace. If you had a judgmental spirit this week, you just go to Jesus and he'll give you more grace grace. He gives more grace. You have a lazy spirit this week. He gives more grace. The blood of Jesus is always flowing. You just got to get back under that fountain. You got to get back under that cleansing flood. You got to let him clean you up again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Listen, he gives you more grace. He gives you more grace. And instantly, sometimes, he gives more grace, and then we take it right back again, and we start to act the same way, but he gives you more grace. Amen. Remember Peter? After Peter's fall, he denies the Lord. He denies the Lord, right? And, and Jesus even told him, Peter, you, you, you're prideful. I'm telling you, before the cock crows, before the dawn comes, you're going to deny me three times. Yeah, no way. Denies him three times. Remember, Peter's all ashamed. He goes away, loves the Lord, repents in his heart. After the resurrection, after the resurrection, remember, Jesus restores him. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Do you love me? Three times, said, do you love me? Do you love me? You remember what Peter started to do right away on that beach during that discourse? Right away, he starts envying again. Right away, he starts wondering. Remember what he says? He goes, well, well Jesus, Jesus, this is what you're going to do with my life. I'm going to be able to suffer for you and glorify you. Jesus tells him a little bit. Peter, do you love me? I love you. All that's going, it's beautiful. And then all of a sudden, he says, this is what I'm going to do in you. You are going to suffer for me. You're going to glorify me in this way. You know what Peter does right away? He goes, well, what's John going to do? What's, what's up with John? Because I know you love him too, but I want you to love me more than you love him. What was he going to do? You know, you know what Jesus tells him? Mind your business. That's what he tells him. Nanya. You do the nanya thing in your house with your kids. You know, nanya, nanya business. Right? That's what he tells him. He goes, nanya, Peter. That's, not, that's in the original Greek. Now listen. Um, he says, but he says, he basically he says, Peter, what's that to you? What's that to you? You follow me. You follow me. Now listen, he's going to give a remedy here. He's going to make it real simple for these people in the church who are suffering, who are struggling, and they're judging, and they're battling, and they're in envy. He, he's going to make it real simple. He says he gives more grace, and he's going to make it real simple. He lays it right out for them how, can, how they can get right with God. And he doesn't say, hey, you need to walk on a, you know, some hot coals for a mile. You need to walk on a bed of nails. You need to go to seven shrinks and, 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 and eight psychiatrists and all these things to get your heart right. He doesn't do any of that. You need to read a litany of so-and-so's books. He's going to make it real simple. Real simple. He's going to tell them to repent. And he's actually going to break it down for them. He's going to tell them how. Verse 7, end of verse 6 first. Wherefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You keep walking in your pride, God's going to resist. You're not going to hear from him. He still loves you, but he's waiting for you to get right. And listen, resist there is a military term. It means he's putting up barriers if you're one of his kids and you're filled with pride. 
Now watch how simple this is to get right with God. Watch how simple. See, the Word of God will tell you. You don't need eight books and psychiatrists and psychologists and all these things and someone to dig down deep into your brain and figure out what's going on in there and, you know, make some soup out of what's going on in there. Who knows what's going on in there? Know what the Bible says about your heart and your brain? That it's deceitful. It's desperately wicked above all things. Only God knows how wicked we are. But the Jesus in you is still alive. Amen. And the Jesus in you can get right with God real quick. Submit yourselves. Submit yourselves. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Listen. Well, it says, submit myself to God. I don't have to submit myself to a boss or to a leader or a leader of a ministry. I don't have to. It says submit yourself to God. Okay, okay, okay. I can play that game too. It does say that. Do you know at the end of every one of Paul's epistles, right? Every single one. Every single epistle starts off with all that Jesus has done for us. And then it moves into our walks with Jesus. And then it moves into the practical way we live out our walks in the body of Christ, in family, with family, and with the government. And whatever government you're under. And do you know how he ends off every single epistle? It says, be submissive one to another in the church. And then, it's in, and, and then he goes from the church to the family. He goes, husbands, be, you make sure you have a submissive heart to God. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. Children, be submissive to your parents and obedient to them. Every single one. And then he goes from there, to, to, from there, right out to the civil authorities. He goes, have a submissive spirit with the governing authorities. For God put them in place for a reason. Even though you don't agree with all their politics, you still should have a submissive spirit. So a Christian that says, I'm submitted to God, I'm submitted to God, that doesn't listen to nobody, is not submitted to God. Get right with God real quick. Have a submissive spirit. Get right with God real quick. Verse 8. Draw, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Draw close to him. Put Jesus back on the throne. Stop lusting and having envy with, against everyone and everything. Draw close to Jesus. Draw nigh to God. Work on your prayer life. Work on your time alone with God. Draw not nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. Look at how he puts it. Cleanse your hands, you bunch of sinners. That means he said, stop using your body to do the wrong thing. Stop grabbing this and taking that and, and doing this. Cleanse your hands, O oh you sinners, and purify your inside, your hearts, because you're double-minded. Some people are getting a spiritual smack right now. Have a penitent heart. Be afflicted. Be afflicted. Please be sorry for your sin. Like the guy that came down from the hill with the Pharisee. Remember they both prayed together? And Jesus gives this little story to his disciples. He goes, there were two guys that went up on this hill to pray. One was a Pharisee. One was a tax collector. The tax collectors were hated. And the Pharisee goes like this. And when he prayed, he goes, God, I thank you that I know my Bible. I thank you that I can quote verses. I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector over here. Lord, I thank you that I give tithes of all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And he went down. And the tax collector couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven because he was afflicted. He was sorry for his sin. He couldn't even look up to heaven. He just beat himself in the chest. He said, God, be merciful to me. I'm just a sinner. Be afflicted. Be afflicted and mourn. If you're dabbling in sin or if you're walking in blatant rebellion, go to God, be, infli be afflicted, mourn. Say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. God, forgive me. Jesus is not going to condemn you. He's going to forgive you. He gives more grace. He gives more grace, but let's not justify it. Let's not say it's okay. Let's not say it's because of this one. It's because of that one. It's because of my family. It's because of the leadership. It's because of this. No, say, God, it's because of me. Forgive me. Forgive me. He's not going to condemn you. 
He's going to tell you like the woman that was taken in adultery. He goes, I don't condemn you. All your condemners went away because I showed them that they were sinners too. But then he said, now go and sin no more. If you're really afflicted and sorry, try to, now, now try to stop sinning. Be afflicted, he says. Listen, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning in, in your joy to heaviness. He says, stop making a mockery out of the things of God. Stop joking about your sin. Stop making like it's no big deal. God gives me grace. I can be forgiven. No, he gives you more grace. Now be sorry for your sin. That's his grace that has cleansed you. See, God makes it real easy. Makes it real easy. I don't have to come up here and try to delve in and dig deep and do all this stuff. I need to pick up the Bible, tell you what it says, let the Holy Spirit speak. God makes it real easy. He says, submit yourself, humble yourself, draw near to God, be, be afflicted over your sins. Blessed are they who mourn, they will be comforted, right? I'm just going to tell you what the Word of God says. It says, humble yourselves. Look what it says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to lift you up. He didn't say to the woman taken in adultery, well, it's good that you learned your lesson. Now stay right there. That's not our God. That's not our Lord. Remember the prodigal son? When he came home, he finally, he was repeating his, you know, his speech of penitence to his father. He goes, I got this speech planned out. I'm going to tell my father as soon as I see him, I'm not worthy to be called his son. Just please, can you make me a hired, ser a hired servant? I'm not worthy. What happens when the father sees him? He's got a penitent heart. He can see it in his walk. He runs to him. He lifts him up. He kisses him on the neck. He starts to recite his thing. God, I don't even want to, his father, I don't even want to be called, you know, your son. You know, just make me a servant. He goes, I don't want to hear any of that. He kisses him on the neck. Kill the fatted calf. Put the choice ring on his finger. Put a robe on him. My son was lost. Now he's found. He's dead. He's alive. Let's celebrate. Now the question for us is when God starts to do that in our lives, remember what the elder brother did? Are we going to be him? Are we going to be him? Remember what the elder brother did? The elder brother said, well, you never threw a party for me like this. I didn't go out and spend my inheritance like this loser. That must have broke the father's heart. That breaks the father's heart when we act that way toward one another. Breaks the father's heart. Remember what the father said? He goes, what are you talking about? Everything I have is yours. It's all in your hands. Can't you just love your brother? My son was dead. Now he's alive. He's lost. Now he's found. God's word makes it real simple. Let's be sorry for us and let's draw nigh to him. Listen, makes it real practical. Verse 11, look what he says. Speak not evil one of another. Stop talking, stop gossiping, stop beating people down with your words. Speak not evil one with another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but you're a judge. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you that judges another? Listen, if you look hard enough into somebody's life, you're going to find some problems. You know what I get from people sometimes is what I get. Well, I don't want to be part of your church yet. I'm like, it's my church. Make it mine. It's all mine. It's our church. It's his church. We're his people. Amen. But that's what they say. I don't want to be part of your church yet because I'm a fruit inspector. I'm a fruit, and I'm inspecting you. I'm inspecting. And I say, what are you inspecting? I just want to make sure. Well, you've been inspecting for three months now. What's your, what are your results? You know what I mean? What did you come up with? Well, and then as soon as I hear it, well, this one's doing this, and this one's doing that, and I think you do this, and you do that. I'm like, you're not inspecting. You're, you're, that, that's what the devil does. You're an accuser of the brethren. You need to get your heart right with God. Get your heart right with God. You look around enough, you know what? You're going to find some problems in people because we're all sinners. We have grace. He gives more grace. He makes it real simple. 
Stop speaking evil about one another. There's one judge that's going to judge the secret hearts and the motives of, of people. The Lord Jesus, go to now, you, you that say, listen to this. And he makes it simple. Stop living like the world. You want to get right with God? You don't need psychiatrists and psychologists and all these things. He says, humble yourself. Draw near to God. Stop being sorry for your sin. Stop speaking evil about other people. Stop judging with envy in your heart. And he makes it real simple. Verse 13, stop living like the world. Go to now, you that say, today and tomorrow we will go such a city. We'll continue continue there a year we'll buy we'll sell we'll get gain he goes don't try to play the game saying you're living for the things of God and you love Jesus all you care about is how you can use this person this city and this place to get what you want out of this life he goes stop living for the things of the world whereas you don't even know what's coming tomorrow for what is your life it's just a vapor that appears for a short time and then it vanishes away. For that you ought to say, if this is what the Lord wills and wants for me, will we shall live or do this or do that. Lord, I'm going to set goals. I'm going to make plans. But you know what? It, it, you know what, Lord? It's not just to use this world, as Paul says, as abusing it like the world does. I'm going to set goals for my family, for my future. Lord, but you know what? If, if I'm getting too carried away with the things of the world and the lust of my eyes, please, God, check those things or take some things away, God. Whatever you want, Lord. If the Lord wills, if this is what the Lord wants for you, that's how we should be living. That's how we should be praying. Makes it real simple. This book's not difficult. I can't understand what the Bible says. He makes it real simple, real simple. There's some deep things in there that are difficult. I get it, because his ways are higher than our ways. But when it has to do with getting right with God, he makes it real simple. Have a penitent heart. Have a humble heart. Have a submissive spirit. Start to obey the word of God. Start to do the things of God. Stop living like the world. Start living for the kingdom. For, for you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Don't boast about the things you've accomplished in the world. If God has blessed you, with some kind of gift or with some kind of monetary gain, some kind of talent, don't stop boasting about that. Well, I have this and I live there and I have attained to this and I have attained to that. You know what the Bible says that people who do that, first of all, they're obnoxious. You ever talk to somebody, they just want to talk about themselves. Okay, I'm done with you. Next. You go, stop doing that. Let's be thankful to God because what do you have, oh man, that you haven't received from the Lord? How about being thankful to God? Because you know what? God has a way of he can strip those things right away in two seconds. Amen. He's not stripping anything from me. I got, a, I got a retirement. I got this set up. I got that set up. You think so? You think so? I remember at the end of the, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, my 401k is gone. What happened? I thought that was a savings account for me. No, it's not. You're trusting it to people to invest it for you when the market crash is gone. Well, I trusted in my company that they were doing it. What? Trust in God because God can take those things away in two seconds. He can give them back to you in two seconds too. We like that part. Almost done, I promise. James is a preacher. I'm trying to be a preacher, so stay with me. Therefore to him... Look what he says. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. He goes, start to look out. Start to let God use you to look out. And when you see there's some need, you see that someone that needs help, you see a church that's trying, to, that's trying to do the work of the ministry, don't withhold yourself in your blessings. He goes, do good to that. Get involved with the things of God. Start to live for Jesus. Put off the old man, put on the new. And you, you know what? Don't be the person that says, I could do this or I should do that or I could do that, but I'm not going to do that. Then God can't use you. Let the Lord lose you. Not lose you, use you. <laughs> I am getting old. I look, the, the grays are starting to come in. People are going to say, great, you don't have that many gray. I got some. 
Start, I'm starting to lose my mind now. Again, pray for me. I say this all the time. I pray for me. Thank you for praying for me. Because half the time I get up here, I study, 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 but I cannot organize my thoughts. I say, God, you've got to organize them when I get up here. And praise the Lord. He gets all the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, um, Lord just, I just ask your blessing upon my brothers and sisters, Lord. Lord, your word is just so clear, Lord, that we get prideful sometimes, Lord. We get lazy sometimes, Lord. We get lustful sometimes, and we envy sometimes, Lord, and we boast sometimes, Lord. And Jesus, you never did any of those things, Lord. And Jesus, we come to you right now. And we just ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to help everyone in this room, everybody that hears this message, those at home may be watching, Lord, or will listen later. Lord, help us to do exactly what James said, Lord. Help us to have a submissive spirit to you, Lord. Help us to draw near to you, Jesus, Lord. Help us to stop speaking evil of one another, Lord. Help us, Jesus, to, to just give us balance, to understand, not to use the things of this world for our own ends, Lord, but to live for your kingdom first, Lord. Lord, have your way. Lord, help us, every one of us in this room, Lord, as we see needs all around us, Lord. We see needs in this church, Lord. We see needs on the mission field. We see needs, Lord. Help us to just do the little things in front of us, Lord. To get involved and not to, to withhold, Lord. Help us to give away our lives and our hearts a little bit more this week than we did last week, Lord. Because you gave everything for us, Jesus, Lord. Bless us. Fill us with your spirit as we try to give you all the glory, Lord. If there's anybody in this room right now that's feeling apprehensive, Lord, that's afraid or scared, or they just sense your Holy Spirit speaking to them on something they need to stop or give up. Holy Spirit, would you send such loving, gentle conviction on them to bring them closer to you, Lord. Let them know how much you love them, that they don't need to be afraid, Lord. Bless your people, Jesus. I know we're hearing from heaven right now, God. Power us by your spirit, Lord. Let us love you, Lord, a little bit of the way you love us. We come in Jesus' name.